Thank you much. Well, as my tiny user already said, I'm Aiden Crenshaw, and the talk today is about funny pot and skitty baiting. Screw you with those, screw with you. First of all, a little bit about me. I live on geek.com. Hope some of you at least decided at some point in time. Woo! Uh, I have an interest in infosec education. Uh, I don't know everything. I'm just a geek with time on my hands. I could be wrong on various technical issues that I am. Come up to me, let me know. I'd be interested in learning the truth. So this particular one is uh, largely played for comedy as well as some technical value. And I'm going to regular on the ISD podcast, and uh, usually on every Thursday. And I'm also a researcher for the Tenacity Institute. It was kind enough to help sponsor getting me here. All right, are you easily offended? I'm looking around at the uh, age of the people in the room, and I think I'm fairly safe. I'm not going to be showing, this um, may talk to you if you are easily offended. It's going to be largely PG-13, but if you follow links or do some Google searching for some of the stuff that's going to appear in the slides, you might psychologically scar yourself. So um, I wouldn't necessarily do that. Uh, also, I am not recommending you doing these things. Neva is nasty, and for that matter, Neva is not a con. They're presented purely for entertainment value. If at any point I accidentally say I did these things, I mean a friend of mine named Bob did these things. <laughs> All right? I did, yeah, sometimes I miss up. Bob has three letters, I has one letter, I get confused, I have a problem with math in my head. There you go. And uh, also, always remember evil is an art form. Kafulu for talking. If you can pronounce the rest of that, let me know. All right, a few defining of terms, so that we're all on the same base for the rest of this talk. Uh, skinny baiting, what do I mean by that? It's sort of like masturbating, but ultimately it accomplishes nothing. It's just there for fun. The idea is to uh, make a skitty or a script kitty hurt themselves whenever they attack you, and do it in a humorous way. And they can't even blame themselves because they're the ones that did it. Now, some people will probably make you feel guilty. Like, my mother has arthritis, and occasionally she would smack me and try to make me feel bad because she hurt her hand. So you might occasionally have that from a skitty, but I didn't get any sympathy from the audience for that one. <laughs> your mom has arthritis. You shouldn't feel bad when she hits you. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, funny pot. Sounds like a honey pot, but instead of being for research, it's more for personal entertainment value, which, you know, doing it for lulls is a completely legitimate research thing in, in my mind. Now, you might ask, is this hacking back? And there's some question about whether or not hacking back is illegal. In this case, if most all these things on the show probably won't consider hacking back because the person is attacking themselves ultimately by doing these things. You're not telling them. It's I wouldn't even say it's quite entrapment, because you didn't tell them to run that EXT they happened to find in a file sharing machine. They just decided to do it. And so legality-wise, I am not a lawyer. And once again, neither I nor Tenacity nor not a con recommend you actually do any of these settings. My friend Bob, however, he might. Um, all right. Some of these ideas are things I've actually pulled off. And some of them are not fully fleshed out. So take someone with a grain of salt. If anybody pulls off some of these uh, stunts, let me know. I'd be interested in hearing about it. Let's go it's illegal, in which case, don't tell me about it. Uh, the core idea is to trick an attacker into hurting or embarrassing themselves. So if you have more ideas, please submit them to me. I'd be interested in hearing them. Ah, the first idea is pretty much a classic. It's fun and flute back. There's no place like home. Um, <laughs> when I think about you, I attack myself. But apologies to the diviners. Essentially, I got this idea from an old IRC joke where someone said, um, hey, I'm going to knock you off the internet. Give me your IP address. First of all, why would you give me your IP address? But second of all, the person responded back, yes, yeah, 127.0.0.1. For those that aren't into IP, essentially that's the local loopback. So anything you send to that gets sent to your local machine. Well. It's local loopback address, but so is anything, and someone pointed this out to me on Finrev, anything 127.0 something 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 is loopback. And everybody looks at 127.0.0.1 and automatically recognizes it. And they know much about computers, it's loopback. But would they necessarily recognize something like 127.69.3.4? Not necessarily. Another best thing you can do is, by giving the IP address at all, you can map a host name for your domain to um, loop back. For instance, if anyone wants to attack a site called hackme1.imgeek.com, feel free to. It's currently mapped to 
1.43.22. Now, uh, one year for an April Fool's joke, I have uh, put this up on my site and said, hey, anybody wants to attack it, go ahead and attack it. And uh, I got some choice quotes in my forum system, some of which I have to think the guy knew what was going on, because it's just a little too perfect to actually be real. But um, first quote from the guy, I'm hitting this box with everything I've got. It seems to be locked down pretty tight, but I think I found a way in now. He's running Linux. In fact, Ubuntu, just as I am. So that gives me an edge. I wonder if I'll just do an rm-rf slash right away or something more sophisticated, like slowly corrupting the files on the drive. I think my response to that was something like, sure, go ahead and do it. Thanks. I've set a cron job to start overwriting the files with uh, dev random exactly at 12 o'clock tomorrow. Muhahahaha. <laughs> well, of course, the inevitable response comes a little while later. Hmm, Angi, I thought you said I could hack your box. Mere seconds before the cron job was to start, I suddenly couldn't log into my own box anymore. Did you hack me in return? That's pretty low. All my files are gone, too. Please, if you have them, restore them. I've got tons of memories in there. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry I mocked you. I'll do anything you want if you can restore my uh, computer. I freely admit you are a much greater hacker than me. And yes, just restore my files, OK? Let's call it quits. I don't want to have to bring the law to this. So how will it be? Like I said, a little too perfect. I'm not quite buying it. but. It's amusing, nothing else. However, this is a riff on the same theme, something I like to call packet swatting. Now, this is another one of those huge warnings, bad ideas, don't do this at home. This is purely offered for educational value, whatever educational value might be there. Uh, to repeat, neither tenacity, not a card, nor myself recommend you do the following. Now, if that lead up, Still, as if you're a pin tester, it might be something you want to be aware of because someone might try to get you in this particular trap. So the moral of the story is confirm your IPs, folks. Here's what packet swatting is. First of all, swatting in real life is essentially where someone fakes a call ID or does some kind of call into the police and says, hey, I got my wife hostage. I'm going to do something bad. And they try to get SWAT called in on somebody else, like their neighbors. It's kind of like one of those um, Frank pizza calls, but taken up several levels. That's what swatting is, basically trying to get the SWAT team called out on someone else. Uh, if you follow um, 4chan, anonymous, raids, and so forth, it's one of the proposed uh, ways of pestering people that is sometimes offered. So this made me start thinking, why stop at loopback for when you're going to map a domain name to an IP address, or host name to an IP address? DNS entries for an organization's domain do not have to map to IP addresses that that organization itself owns. So what steps would Bob do? Because obviously I would never do this, and I would never recommend anyone else do this. But if you're attacking the system as a pen tester, you might want to look out for it. Do an NS lookup on uh, fsb.ru, uh, some scary government agency.gov, or uh, a couple different sites in China, since a lot of attacks seem to be coming from Russia and China. Find out the IP address of some interesting website or a server there. Map a host name to an IP address found in step one. Tell the skitty, profit. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow not as funny when it's parked in your driveway. Like I said, I'm not recommending this. I'm just saying it's something you should be aware of if you're a pen tester. All right, next attack I want to talk about is lemon wiping. Uh, for when you really want that hard drive of yours to have that unclean feeling. By the way, for anybody that's wondering about anti forensics and all that, if you wipe it once, that's good enough. It's dead. People ain't giving crap back. There's some things about the bad block list that people might be able to get stuff back from, and then, uh, like a uh, sector's been marked as uh, bad and it's been deallocated, and someone can still get that back. But for that, wiping one time is just fine. Um, most people, when they wipe a drive, they'll wipe with like all zeros, all ones, or a ran random uh, bits. And sometimes do multiple iterations of that, even though it's not necessarily uh, useful. But why not do an arbitrary pattern? Why just limit yourself? Now, whole idea is to write it over at least once. It doesn't matter what pattern you use. So this could be really fun for you know forensic examiner or for someone who you've uh, given an old thumb drive to and who happens to look at 
you know, not that I would ever do this, but I've heard those people out there who, um, you know, if they get a thumb drive from someone else or they get like an old SD storage card, will pop it in to a machine and uh, use something like PhotoRec to do a data carve down it. So even though it's been formatted, if it hasn't been completely white, they'll look for the headers and footers of known file types like docs or images and pull them off. Well, for those kind of snoopers, those things you can do. Why write with arbitrary you know, zeros or ones? Choose something specific. It's party time. Lemon party time. <laughs> Essentially, you find an image that you would like to share for artistic value with someone who might be a snooper. Uh, this is probably something you might want to do to snoopers, because if you do this to an actual forensic examiner, you know, first of all, it would be destruction of evidence, so that would be legally very bad. There's certain sort of ways, policy-wise, you can say when you wipe data, when you don't wipe data, duty preserve, that's beyond the scope of this talk. So I'm not recommending this at all from a legal standpoint. Uh, but if a forensic examiner came across this, it'd probably inspire them to look harder for data. So really not recommend it, but it's really fun for snoopers. Essentially, I have a couple scripts up here using either DD or by creating one big file where you take an image and you duplicate it across the entire drive to wipe all of it with a certain sort of pattern. So that whenever they try to do recovery, all they get back is multiple copies of that exact same image. <laughs> uh, and of course, everybody hopefully has guessed why it's called Lemon Wipe at this point. If you don't know, don't Google for it. I... <laughs> Alright, robots.txt trolling. Um, you probably heard about star mini podcasts. I was at a Louisville InfoSec once, and um, Paul S. Dorian was giving a speech, and he mentioned robots.txt. Like, Check out Aiden's or something. I'm like, dude, there might be people here with my resume. Uh, don't tell them to check out my robots.txt file. Uh, but one of the first things a pen tester might do is check out our website, would be look at the robots.txt file. For those who don't administrate uh, web servers, one of the things the robots.txt file is there, of course, when spiders from like Google or Yahoo come around, you can put uh, instructions inside your robots.txt file and say, do not index this particular directory or page. Well, if someone doesn't want that indexed by Google, it probably doesn't mean that it's something semi-private that they don't want everybody to know about. If it's really private, why they put it on the web server in the first place is a question. But uh, since it's something that might be confidential or interesting, pen testers and hacker types like to go out and look at robots.txt and then go look at those particular directories. So what I've done is a little different. I've added this particular robots.txt file to my site so you see disallow private and disallow secret. Um, any pen tests in the crowd, what would you do if you uh, saw that in the robots.txt file? You're saying that, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, someone else's site, Dave. Go browse to it. Actually, I have one in my logs where someone browsed to it and said, are you effing retarded? <laughs> well, he was definitely mentally scarred by the time he was finished. Because essentially what I've done is, when you go to those pages, it brings up an index and automatically logs the connection, and then forwards you on to a place just in the domain name, rule34.panhill.net, that uh, has various images that uh, won't hurt your computer. I suppose I could take them to a drive-by malware site or something, but um, instead it scars the site. This gives you a rough idea of uh, what comes up. Of course, I log the IP so I can go look at it later and uh, be a fun person. And uh, if you want alternatives, go out to wikipedia.org and look up shock site. Plenty of great places you can redirect folks to. But uh, like I said, don't go to my robots.txt file. I'm telling you right now, you don't want to see it. If you <laughs> do go out and see it, then you've been forewarned. And forewarned is wrong. Another option is DNS fun. What's in a name? Now, what you can do is go out to your machine and I usually, uh, all my machines, I statically set my uh, DNS service to point to, um, oh, I'm telling you the name of the service I do, I think it's DNS. Um, so I open DNS, and I map it to that. But you might want to have an access point in your house that you have open to everybody. I, just because you're too lazy to encrypt it. First of all, let me recommend encrypt it. No matter what, just encrypt it. It's not that difficult to do. Um, however, you're lo losing some uh, lull potential by not allowing people to connect to it. Also, sometimes you might have some odd equipment that doesn't properly support 
your WPA, uh, so you may want to leave it open. Also, you may just have a spare routed that you want to you know, pull this plank on. So you can map your own uh, DNS static on your machine, but have your uh, router hand out a DNS service that point Google and MySpace and everything else to um, less than seemly sites, let's say. Now, um, you can do this by hand. Uh, the way I'm going to show you how to do it here in a second is I've set things up in DDWRT where essentially if you go into DDWRT on the router itself, no extra software, no extra DNS to the point to, you can use the onboard DNS masquerading uh, functionality and remap certain domain, certain uh, host names to certain IP addresses. I think we're seeing where this is going. Now, vhost might be a problem. For instance, if you find a site you want to redirect someone to, redirecting to just the IP address may not be enough. The host name may matter. Now, if I'm remapping something to irongeek.com, the IP address that irongeek.com runs on, I also control, um, to some uh, extent, uh, the virtual um, hosts that uh, that particular box will accept. So I can do as I wish with that. But essentially, you can remap those names to uh, certain uh, bad, naughty IP addresses. Be creative. Think about places you might want to map someone to. Uh, all sorts of ideas out there. Another thing you can do is be patronizing to an attacker. It's one thing to fail. It's another thing to fail and be made fun of in the process. Now, this one I used to have set on my machine until it, uh, on my server until it uh, kind of started taking a few minutes to some resources. There's a tool called PHP IDS. This is a simple intrusion detection system for um, PHP applica web applications. You can install it fairly easily. You can download it from phpids.org. Uh, I have instructions on my website on setting all this up. Some things are just a lot easier to read than it is to explain. Um, but essentially, by the time I have it all set up, all I have to do is, in my PHP files, add this little include of the IDS stub, and I'm good to go. And uh, what I've done is had PHP IDS trigger certain functionality whenever it sees an SQL or an uh, XSS injection attack. Here's the functionality. Let's say someone tried a simple common uh, SQL uh, attack on my site. What it would do is it would pop up Clippy here and say, hello, according to PHP IDS, it looks like you were trying to pwn my site. Would you like some help with that? <laughs> and I point them off to one of my tutorials on I think like the OWASP top 10 or something like that so I can help them out. You know, just doing my part to help educate skitties. All right, don't look in places that don't belong to you. This is file shares, fun drives, and other media. Uh, Bob likes to go to HackerCon and scan the network for open file shares. Let's say he finds one. How safe is it to actually look at the files in it? First of all, it could be some of the images I've mentioned previously in the talk. That could be bad enough. But barring that, it could be other interesting things. By the way, uh, NetScan, uh, I think it's some soft perfect. It's really cool for scanning a network, finding all the open file shares, finding out what your uh, access permissions are to them. Pretty nifty. Uh, now, uh, you can basically put something out there, or Bob can, that's in the file share, certain types of documents. Obviously, an EXE would be one thing, but hopefully someone's not going to be dumb enough this one arbitrary EXEs they see <laughs> sitting out in some uh, share they found at a hacker con. But you never know. Um, but PDFs are also an option because, you know, if you're a hacker type and you scan a network, you see social security info, I think, in, oh, sorry, I just say info, uh, about PDF, you might want to open that kind of thing. But um, as far as security vulnerabilities in Adobe over the last, like, two years or so, is anybody to give me a quick synopsis of that? I think that one word pretty much sums it up. <laughs> And a great thing is Metasploit has a lot of these capabilities built in for generating files that will exploit people who aren't running the brand newest version of Adobe Acrobat. There's other file formats that can also be exploited, but this is one you should probably look into. And you can have to do arbitrary things. Uh, you know, install anything you want, uh, I don't know, write an EXE and change the background. You, you have arbitrary code execution, run wild. I mean, that's what you can do pretty much anything you want with it. But another option, um, has anybody seen the talks I've done on uh, Darknet? Well, 
One of the things about dog nets is, since you're hiding your IP address, you're only really hiding your IP address if you're going through the browser that is configured to use that proxy, or if it's a VPN-based uh, dog net, then I suppose it covers more bases. So let's say it's one that's just uh, browser-based. Let's say you served this up a PDF that had some instructions to say, go out to this website and make a transaction. It's not necessarily going to use the, and honor the proxy that's built into the web browser. So you might be able to identify someone's true IP address from hosting a file and them opening it and inadvertently exposing themselves on a dark net. All right, we'll talk a little bit about exotic injection vectors. When people think of uh, SQL injection and cross-site scripting, they usually think of uh, web forms. But there's a whole lot more you can do with just that. There's usually always someone, I think it was Kat who's speaking in the other hall right now, um, there's always someone at Nauticon every year who has to pull up this Bobby Tables XKCD uh, construct. Essentially what it is is the mom names her son's uh, middle name to be drop tables in an SQL formatted command so that whenever the school administration you know, adds into the roster, it kind of causes a certain uh, consternation. This kind of starts me thinking about how many other ways can you actually do a SQL injection or cross-site scripting for that matter that don't involve actually entering into the web form. Um, think about it from this way. Lots of things feed into databases that aren't web forms. A barcode that's scanned by somebody is ultimately going to feed into a, a database. How many people do you think actually sanitize the data that's coming into a barcode input? You do now. Uh, but in general, I imagine most people aren't. Also, just because what you're submitting the data into isn't HTML, doesn't mean it doesn't get represented in HTML at some other later point in time. How many people use a non-HTML application, a non-web-based application, but the report you get back from it is presented to you in a web page? So this opens up all sorts of possibilities. Also, another thing you want to look into is user agent strings. There are people who have sanitized all the form input, but they might have uh, logs, that, and these logs will have information about what browser the user was using. If they don't sanitize their uh, user agent strings, that's another interesting vector. Possibly out of the scope of this talk, but still fun. Computer names and descriptions. Let's say you have a homebrew app for scanning a network and doing inventory of what machines are out there. What if someone inserted in a, to the computer name or description a small SSS attack or a SQL injection? Wireless SSDs. This one can be a little bit harder to pull off because depending on the particular router you're configuring or how you're setting things up, some care just all oh, or not allowed, but it's another potential thing to try. Of course, event logs, since someone takes their event logs, doesn't sanitize it at all and imports the data into an HTML format report. That could be big fun. And of course, sniff passwords. Unfortunately, this one didn't work out for me. At DEF CON, I was hoping to get up on the wall of sheet by deliberately sending a password with plain text across the network, and the password happened to be like a cross-site scripting attack. But uh, since they do everything by hand with people, or well, at least mostly, uh, my understanding. They caught that and they didn't post it up. I was so hoping to be wrapped the entire uh, wall of sheet there, but <laughs> alas, no luck. But at least this should give you inspiration. If anybody actually tries these against authorized users, um, let me know, because I'd be interested in seeing how this worked out for you. If you want more information on you know, general exotic uh, cross-site scripting and SQL injection, I have a whole web page out there on it. Um, sorry about the very uh, unuser friendly URLs. They're very Google friendly, but not so user friendly. These slides will get from my website later, or I'll give them to you any time you want during the conference, if you're willing to plug my thumb drive into your machine. <laughs> <laughs> if you want information on uh, various, this is exactly totally like the stuff I was talking about before, but uh, certain security tools out there also have vulnerabilities. So let's say, for instance, you know someone who's attacking networks might be finding up Wireshark to see what's off on the network. Well, Wireshark in the past has had various security vulnerabilities in the dissector. So go out to ExploitDB and do searches for these particular applications and these particular words and see what comes up. Buffer overflows in Wireshark, send some arbitrary data out there in the line between someone to sniff and then uh, causes all sorts of problems for them whenever they do. Uh, there's been cross-site scripting attacks against uh, Xcripto, which is another sniffing package. There's been buffer overflows in uh, Retina's Wi-Fi security scanner. 
And there's also been a bunch of overflows and pains that matter. If someone doesn't keep the security tools up and patched, that could also be a potential way of exploiting someone. Also, slightly related, the people who just run backtrack and then start up services but don't change the default passwords, root, tour, can be a whole lot of fun. All right. Fun with thumb drives and USB. Portable evil. This is my little evil USB. Like it. Adorable. Flip off with slight modifications from Microsoft. Flip off from Microsoft with slight modifications for me. All right. Many options for thumb drives. Those bad files, like I mentioned previously, you know, that whole uh, tax.pdf thing I mentioned, or badly formatted uh, uh, Word doc, if that happens to be some kind of uh, vulnerability there. You all remember back when you used to be, you'd say you were safe from malware by just opening data and not EXEs or any executable? That used to be a common thing is, oh, don't worry about it, you can't have a virus from a doc. Unfortunately, that's not really true anymore with the way that. Uh, applications across different document formats. There's also, of course, the old U-free option. For those who don't know what a U-free thumb drive is, I'm not supposed to be from this room do, but uh, since a U-free thumb drive has a partition on it that looks uh, like a CD-ROM to the system, and so you can use the uh, auto-run INF to automatically execute code. I use a U-free tool for this. A lot of tools you'll find for making your own uh, U-free thumb drive are XP only and really out of date. This one works in uh, well, Windows 7 and Linux and uh, older OSs as well, so. What's that? Oh, I was going to have a comment that's a better tool. Uh, if you want some uh, really interesting shenanigans that someone's pulled off one of these fun drives, look at the story of uh, Steve and you're a better man than I if you can pronounce that last name. Danaskis Kunis? Uh, he works for a company, Secured Network Technologies, Incorporated. They did a pen test where uh, I believe they were pen testing a, a credit union. So what they did was they got a bunch of thumb drives and they put some custom malware on it. And generally speaking, AV is not going to catch custom malware. I suppose if it has a really, really good uh, analytical engine for looking for heuristics, maybe. But generally speaking, custom malware, not so much. Or if it's been uh, encoded with Chicago Ganai. What's, what's been the success rate on Chicago Ganai as far as getting past most AV? 21 out of 43. So, Pretty decent chance of getting through. Go out and read his story. He had a huge success rate of just leaving these things out in the parking lot. People would go in, plug them in, and he'd own the network. <laughs> uh, want information on different payloads? Hack 5 Switchblade, it's a web page there that has a lot of good details. It's also been used for more than just attacking um, uh, PC, I think so, PC tool. Uh, Russell Bunderini, he came up with an uh, instant response Switchblade that essentially collects a ton of different information about the system so that the sort of live information you need when you're doing for, uh, instant response that you lose if you turn off the machine. However, you don't necessarily want that machine up and possibly attacking other boxes at the same time. So his compromise was he'd give this uh, thumb drive out to various remote locations and they could use it for quickly collecting data and shutting down the machine. That was the compromise they went with. There's other USB options, however. Um, this one is going to be a little bit more price prohibitive. Uh, who has seen my talk on programmable kid USB keyboard dongles? Thanks. Oh, cool. Uh, also, I usually call them by the uh, spelled out acronym, you know, fucked. Essentially, what it is, it's a little Tensy microcontroller, it's like 18 bucks. And you can program it to be a keyboard and mouse. You can hook up sensors to it so it can go on and off by light. You can have it, you know, fire up eight minutes after something's been plugged in. There's tons of different options. I'm currently working on one to act as a keylogger, too, so you can even set these keystrokes. Then we play them later on when they're not there, like they're using the password to log back in. Uh, that one, I got a broken prototype, but it's, yeah, it's not quite a prime time. But um, the nice thing about these Tensies, they're so small, you can embed them in other things. Like I have one that's embedded in a mouse. Uh, Dave's embedded one in a keyboard before. Um, and these things are good for pranking. Unfortunately, at 18 bucks a pop, it might be a little prohibitively expensive for those kind of pranks. But if you want more information on making one of these, or you want to see one at the con later on, I have them with me. Now, what about dead drops? This is also kind of unrelated to my core subject matter. Um, this has become kind of popular in maker spaces. Essentially, this one's not about attacking attackers, but it's still something that kind of concerns me. Uh, dead drop looks something like this. Essentially, they've taken a USB thumb drive, 
maybe a trunk set, it could be a different type of device, you know. That's all you see in the wall. And it's put there so people can share files back and forth anonymously. Just walk into the wall and uh, copy files to it or pull files from it. Is this really a good idea? You know, it's kind of like the digital, digital equivalent of a boy. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wrap my head around why you want to do that. I mean, it's, like, it's kind of neat, but you know, put, put a UFI thumb drive in there and people have auto run enabled or they put in one of these Tensi devices. There's all sorts of screwed up ways they can mess with someone. And um, this is actually a more practical way of screwing with people with, uh, not that I recommend it, because this one isn't even attacking the attackers. This is totally bad. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Uh, this might be a more practical thing for a Tensi because then it's embedded in concrete or embedded in brick with behind mortar, so maybe it's not as likely to be stolen. Then again, if you just got pwned by one of these USB devices that are hanging out a wall and you know it, you're probably ripping that wall down and destroying that device. Or at least, you know, taking it out and uh, reverse engineering it yourself. All right, unguarded equipment. Also, I sometimes refer to it as the inverse USB attack. People uh, think about, well, I don't want to put this thumb drive into my machine because they might try to own me via audit run or something like the Tensi device. People don't necessarily think about, though, um, what that machine might be doing to the thumb drive. So let's think about this for a second. No one at HackerCon has ever messed with my stuff. At home's a different matter. Some girl I spawned, uh, I had my profile up in Facebook or something, and uh, she went in and uh, changed various premises of mine. So, you know, I've had my machines messed with, but never by my hacker buddy. So it's always by someone else. And at HackerCon, I never had anybody mess with my stuff. Even though earlier today, I tried to get someone to mess with my stuff. Anyway, but what if they did? If I happen to, you might have seen me do this a couple times during the conference, leave my stuff just laying someplace. No one messed with it, but let's say what if they did? Well, one of the things you can do is uh, suck the data off their thumb drive when they plug it in. They pwn you, you pwn them. And I have a tool out there called thumb suck for doing just that kind of uh, task. And that, in those cases, you know, encryption, like let's say what you have on an IMD, shouldn't matter because for them to use the thumb drive, they have to unencrypt it. And at that point, the system just start copying files off. Uh, you can install something bad on the flash drive, which would be an option. And of course, you can scar them emotionally, which is something I usually always, you know, put forth as a valid idea. Now, um, as far as that's concerned, you can also uh, do things to get reaction shots whenever you mess with someone. Um, so <laughs> let's say you've got a webcam built in, which is most notebooks have a webcam built in. And uh, there's a tool out there called motion detection that will uh, turn on the webcam and start recording a video whenever it sees motion in front of the, the webcam. Uh, there's various great shock sites out there. So let's say you um, design your own screensaver, or at least a stub that sits there and intercepts the screensaver, and whenever someone doesn't hit the right key sequence to unlock the screen, or whenever they hit it to get past the screensaver, it brings up certain um, less than seemly images, let's say. Well, you have a webcam there already, so why not make a reaction shot of all that? A special key would be needed to get past it. Auto or loop trick, I got some really simple code in auto that essentially sits there, and it automatically starts up one of Windows' built-in screensavers. You can choose the one you want to use. So you don't even have to write the screensaver code yourself. You can use one's one that's already installed, and it will automatically run a script afterwards if the person didn't hold the right key sequence down while getting rid of the screensaver. What if the theme can't be unseen? <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I wanted to test this bad boy out, and uh, I didn't quite succeed in that. This is about the best I could do. Uh, this is just a proof of concept. I want to get it running but um, no one pulled the bait for me uh, earlier today. So here I am at a, a friend's house, and I set up a machine and say, you know, I go for a scenario, and Dave comes over to look at it, and well, he knows me, so he didn't look at it very long. <laughs> but the idea is to get cool reaction shots via uh, leaving hardware around for people to screw with. All right, a few dishonorable mentions. These are not ideas I've come up with, but I've had some of the ideas previously were just uh, riffs on things that other people have done. But there are some people who have done uh, whacked out things that are to a degree that I really want to uh, 
give them dishonorable mentions. What mind think alike, as they say. All right, Pete Stevens, he screwed around with uh, various uh, Wi-Fi piggybackers. Once again, you should be encrypting your networks, you live with security. But if you have spare routers and you want to mess around with people, I suppose you could, you know, do that. What he did was, uh, he went and put his access points up, used IP tables to redirect to a transparent proxy. This transparent proxy messed with the information. Now this could be stuff like SQL injections. You could do more malicious stuff than this dude uh, ended up doing. What he did was he flipped all the images upside down. And he has full details on his website on how he did it. Uh, I seem to call someone doing something similar to Freaknik. And since Freaknik is, a hotel, is at this hotel where uh, it's some of the Freaknik guests and some people who are just general guests. Well, one of the general guests apparently visited a MySpace and they were like, complaining in the elevator about these hackers who messed around and owned the MySpace. And while she, she's there, I think it was Kerbop. She looks over the person beside her in the elevator and it's one of the guys who was in the pictures on our MySpace. Because <laughs> <laughs> at Freaknik, they don't just flip images and stuff like that. They sometimes, on certain websites, replace images. So they decided to replace them with uh, images of people who regularly attend the conferences. And I think that was uh, Kerbob at that in incursion. Another uh, thing that people like to do is scam baiting. Uh, here, most people here probably know about the whole uh, 419 scammer thing. You know, you hate being contacted by Nigerian princes all the time. Well, what these people do on this website is they uh, play along with the scam and get various funny pictures taken of the people. They'll say, all right, I'll send you your uh, $2,000, but first I need a show of trust. Take a picture of you doing this particular silly action. And they'll get the pictures, and they'll eventually they'll post them up into the Hall of Shame. <laughs> Definitely worth going to have a look at. I was trying to find the safest picture to post up in that, and so I just used I went out and uh, used that particular image. But visit that website sometime. Another honorable mention, honed by the owner. Now, this was a talk at uh, last year's DEF CON. Some of you may know Zaz. I don't personally, but I have newfound respect. Well, I have, don't know the guy, so I have respect the guy a lot because of this particular talk. It was amusing. He had some Mac equipment stolen from his machine. So was that, from his, uh, his uh, living space. And uh, he didn't do backups like he, he should have. And he thought the stuff was gone for good. He had um, hoped to use dynamic DNS to recover the information because he had the machine set up to uh, automatically uh, renew the uh, lease the dynamic DNS. And he had all sorts of stuff set up like BNC and whatnot on the machine. So if it ever reported itself to the dynamic DNS, he could get back into it because he'd know where it was at. Uh, unfortunately, he had set up a static network on it. So the attacker, if he didn't know anything about computers, probably couldn't get on the network. Well, some time passes, and eventually his MacBook shows back up. So, he gets the information, and he finds out the box was not new to be built. So all the tools he had on the box at the time are still there. So he had a secure shell and VNC, so he could go into the box and uh, mess around with the guy. So, not only does he get pics of the guy, gets unemployment docs, so you won't get name and such and that, address, browsing info, key logs, passwords that the guy's been using, dating profiles, <laughs> watch the talk, get some funny stuff, and um, also unimpressive nudes. <laughs> uh, finally, he sends the cops. Luckily, he still has a serial number, so if you have expensive like, computer equipment around, that might be worth writing down and keeping someplace else. He now also, I believe, keeps a backup of his parents in Australia. And uh, if you want to see the video, you can find it out on YouTube. But uh, just Google up Home by Owner. Definitely worth the, walk, worth the watch. Uh, another example of uh, someone uh, attacking back of sorts or uh, messing around with the attackers is the Jester versus Anonymous. Um, these people have been at each other's vote for a while. And, well, Jester, to my knowledge, is just one guy. And the Anonymous op the anonymous uh, faction that he's been having issues with, I think, is the non-ops. But um, I don't know if we can talk on that coming up next month. There's a tool out there called a DHN. You've probably heard of low orbit ion cannon. Think of something in a similar vein. Well, this tool is open source, and people did download it from like one reliable site. They get it from all over. Someone say, hey, download this denial service attack and join in our campaign against such and such other group. Well, he went out and modified it. But see, one of the advantages, supposedly, of uh, 
uh, DHN was that it would use Tor to obfuscate uh, command and control so people won't necessarily know who's pulling off the attack. It also said something about spoofing the IP address and the MAC address. If you're doing it over an internet connection, why are you spoofing the MAC address? I'm a little confused by that. That shouldn't be going out anyway. It only on, should only be visible on the local LAN. Following certain odd protocols like NetBIOS. I'm going into a divergency uh, there. If I'm wrong on that, talk to me later. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. Uh, but it, it's open source, so the Jets decided to you take it and modify it. And we upload it to all sorts of other locations and spread the word. So people started downloading this particular uh, denial of service tool, and it would give away the location and information about the attacker. And my understanding is just to collect all that, all those details. I've also read about this being done in the past where people would, would take exploit code and post it, and it was enough to help someone who actually understood the code to uh, do something with it and be a good proof of concept, but it was designed in such a way that the average uh, skitty would might hurt themselves if they tried to run it. Uh, the common um, way of doing that nowadays is to make valid exploit code, but just have it automatically, uh, for the shell code part, just pop up calculator. Underneath the idea that someone who's that malicious may not necessarily know enough to be able to modify the payload. And finally, Jason Scott. Now, Jason Scott couldn't be here this year, so I wanted him to be here in spirit, at least. He's known for all sorts of things. How many people know Jason? I love Jason's talks. Uh, he, he's a very amusing guy. But he had it, and he's known for like uh, textfiles.org, BBS documentary, now he's got one out on the text adventures. And of course, he owns like the most popular cat on Twitter, Socketing the Cat. Probably got more followers than he does. Actually, I actually have pretty much guarantee it does. Uh, you, he had a bunch of uh, people hotlinking to images on his site. Specifically, from a MySpace profile, a bunch of people were uh, hotlinking to this really cool image of uh, the Grim Reaper. I mean, Jason archives tons of stuff, and this is some of the artwork he had archived. Well, some MySpace uh, template company decided to put this in the uh, templates. And uh, what should he do about this? I mean, that's sucking up a lot of his bandwidth. And you know, normally sharing is OK. If someone was just pointing towards it for educational values, like saying, back in 94, someone put up this cool image on a BBS, he'd be fine with it. But for MySpace, and people sucking up all his bandwidth, eh, that's not so kosher. So what should he do about it? Well. <laughs> He's known for goat seeing MySpace. Essentially, what he did is he replaced the image with an image of Goatsy. You don't know what Goatsy is? Don't Google for it. You don't want it. <laughs> um, the Hot Free Layouts, the company that actually uh, was uh, hot linking to his image, even contacted him and asked him to stop. They contacted him for text support. You're, you're, you're still in my bandwidth, and you're contacting me for text support? What's the deal with that? Um, if you want more details on it, he has a great write-up out there called Freedom, Justice, and a Disturbingly Gaping Ass. <laughs> like, Jason? Oh. <coughs> Finally, if you have any other ideas for screwing around with people, that are legal, of course. And uh, I'd love to hear them. Also, if you're using these techniques to great uh, benefit, let me know, because I'd, like uh, I'd like to hear about those stories as well. Maybe put them in future presentations. Thanks, of course, to Nauticon for having me here. Uh, Gene Bransfield for looking over and getting feedback on my uh, slides. Nasty for helping get me here. And my buddies at DerbyCon and the ISD Podcast. A few events I'd like to go ahead and uh, mention real quick. There's DerbyCon, which is happening September 30th to October 2nd in Louisville, Kentucky. That's like about a six hour drive south from here. So hopefully it's central enough that my buddies who are at conferences down in Atlanta will come up and my buddies who are up in Cleveland will also come down. So we've got a good location there. Also, there's a Louisville InfoSec, which is happening the Thursday before DerbyCon. So if you want to make it a, you know, a long InfoSec trip, it would be a good time. Uh, other cons to mention, SkydogCon, of course, uh, DojoCon, HackerCon, Freaknik, Nauticon, which I'm mentioning in the slides, so obviously you all know about Nauticon, and AutoZone, usually all conferences I end up going to. And finally, are there any questions? Yes? Yeah, it'll be up on ongeek.com um, probably Monday or Tuesday. And if you really want the slides, I can give it to you now.
put your thumb drive in this computer. <laughs> I got one right over here you can use. <laughs> Same one Dave used last night. Any other questions? Well, in that case, I thank you very much for your time.